Okay, so part two, um, which again, if you want to ask a question, don't wait till the end. Do it because it's like you, you might never get to answer or you'll forget the question. So um, this is a kind of site-specific project. Um, you remember the violin was a wheeling violin going across the desert. Well, when I got back to Australia after some time in, in Europe in 2001, I wanted to continue this idea of sound moving through space. And um, I sort of set about uh, with... A, there's a violin maker in Sydney called Harry Tiliotis, who's a sort of very wayward... I mean, as you can imagine, violin making is about as conservative as violin playing. You know, you don't mess with the tradition. You just keep churning out these things that look like strads all the time. Uh, but Harry is, a, is a up for anything. And so with, with Harry and his... what became our best friend, Paul Bryant, who very interestingly by trade, is a dentist. Um, uh, but a sort of renaissance man. There's nothing he doesn't know about woodwork, metalwork, or mechanics. And we sort of we saw, formed this kind of trio uh, whereby we did this experimentation uh, with this idea that we wanted sound moving through space. Now, of course, if you're going to have a motor attached to it, anything's going to travel, you're going to have that as part of the mix. So bicycles seem like the ultimate sort of an, an, an easily accessible, cheap, and fairly sound free themselves as they move around. So the sound we moved around. And then we, we started to think about, well, how to engage the me mechanism of a bicycle to make sound. And of course, you know, the, probably the, arguably the greatest invention that our species ever came up with was the wheel. And um, it goes round. And when something goes round, that means it gives you some kind of continual mechanism, a continuity of mechanism. And that's very useful for mechanical instruments. And mechanical instruments, even though they have a certain sort of repetition, uh, it's not like making a loop, a digital loop, because they never repeat exactly the same. And because we're using um, uh, materials which are thrown away, this, you know, this barely, barely functional, often the stuff doesn't work very well, which gives a certain character to it. So we're going to... Uh, um, this project happened, I mean, I'm trying to make it, you know, to give you an idea about how I go about doing a project from scratch. That's basically what I'm trying to do with this bit. So this, this pursuit project, it's a bicycle sound project. Uh, first start, it's been done three times now. And uh, each time it's got <laughs> bigger and bolder to the extent that the last time we did it, which is the one we're going to look at, Canberra, I think that's the last one because it was just, the, the workload was, was excessive. I mean three of us working flat out for three months. There were 130 instruments on bikes by, by the end of it. Um, it was supposed to be a community project, of course, like all good things. Um, but the community you know, is, is also happy to watch other people work. Uh, and so the community maybe contributed about 20 of those 130 bikes, I'd say. The rest we, we made or we reused from earlier projects. Okay, so the site-specific thing. So Canberra. Um, Canberra is probably the most boring town in the world. Um, <laughs> certainly uh, people who live there think that, and anybody who visits is really sure after a matter of minutes. Um, it was invented because they couldn't decide whether Sydney or Melbourne should be the capital, and so they reached a sort of very good British compromise. They had something in the middle, and it just happened to be right there in the middle, um, between Sydney and Melbourne. So they, they invited an architect to come and sort of have this grand dream, and of course it was never built, you know, because as with all bureaucratic things and architecture, the thing never happens, it always gets compromised on the way. So it's what they call a bush capital, which means that there's no, the town really doesn't exist, it's like it's just lost, there's no, it's very hard to have a sense of community where anything happens. But the one thing they did sort of consider were, were bicycles. Uh, bicycle lanes, and anywhere else in Australia, you get on a bicycle, you're risking life and limb. So uh, Canberra has bike lanes, it has a bike community, 
and they asked me for their centenary, the hundredth birthday, uh, to come up to, to do the bicycle project in Canberra. And it looked difficult because, like, who am I going to? You know, it's supposed to be a community project, but where is the community in Canberra? Just you know, you can't find them. But once I was been there a few times, I realised there was this bizarre underground um, society. Basically, by day they were bureaucrats, and then like in the evening they were put on, you know, army helmets and fatigues, and get on bicycles and go apeshit around the town on their bikes. So it was sort of like this sort of Jacqueline Hyde kind of sort of um, people in there who were totally bike fanatics, and um, and you'll see some of them appearing in this. So I sort of got, I found my community. It wasn't big, but it was like about twenty people or so who were just up for this. So that was a start. The second thing was to, then to find a place where we could do it. And this picture up here is actually the um, the, the the place where they run the roads and the traffic lights from. It's like basically they do the repairs, they dig up the road, they do work, road works, anything to do with infrastructure around the town it comes out of this place here. And they had this sort of uh, incredible building which was unused um, and we got permission to sort of get in there. What's weird about this photograph, there are no cars and normally this was the car park where everybody worked in the offices were over here. And I would say about 75% of my time leading up to this project, was involved in negotiating with the people. Would they mind giving up their car park space uh, for this performance? It was like, it, 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 was, it just went on meeting after meeting. No, they wouldn't. No, they couldn't. No, they, it was like, anyway, this was, photograph was taken on the, on the three days where we had access and no cars. And so then the next thing I've got to think about is... Um, This is really doesn't know the other side. That's so that's the that, that was the map. <laughs> um, so it takes about um, two and a half minutes to cycle around there. It's a really big space. And uh, then we started to make the machines. Now the first machine, the photograph you see of here. This became our sort of like bog standard bike that makes a sound. And uh, it's. That gives you a good sense of it. So we had these kind of basically a drop down metal strip. And as the spokes went round, this strip would be hit. And that was on a fulcrum like this. And that hits whatever we put on the front of it. In that case, like a tom-tom we found on the street. But it worked with anything like a polystyrene box, um, uh, pans, pots and pans, any, any noise, you know, any, any resonant material. And it worked. And so that was our thing that whenever we weren't doing something else more exotic, we'd be making one of these because they were very quick to make and they worked and they had a, we had a track record. And also, they... Often the speeds were beyond the speeds of what you could actually play physically. So we had a, a mechanical device which made sense in the sense that a human being couldn't play at that, that kind of tempo. And it, but it was in real time. And that means that the, your, your rhythmic uh, information is less interesting than the tonal stuff that starts to happen. And um, with this uh, tonal material... That's very useful when sound is happening over space or through space because the ear can follow it. If you have stuff that's, that's too variable, too kind of, you know, second beginning score composition, too blinky plonky modernist music, it, do, it doesn't travel well. But a, a continued stream of sound is something that the ear follows very quickly and gets used to. It can see the changes of, you know, as you know, a car coming towards you or one going away, you know, when you cross the street, you're aware of all this kind of stuff. So this is the kinds of areas we are interested in this project. I'm going to switch um, movies to some live video now. And this has got, you know, most of the hundred and says a frying, uh, a baking pan. Um, anyway, I'll go to the other movie, uh, which is the...
let's do some of the performance first before we look at the actual selection. So I'm going to go into quite some detail about how these instruments are made, but first of all, I'll, I'll, there's a bit of video from the performance. Um, not only do we have live sound going around the track, but we also had interactive quadraphonic sound system as well set up, and we've got um, a genuine Aussie bicycle champion um, to have the interactive gear on her bike, and you'll see her at the beginning, dressed in yellow and um, green. And so she, on her bicycle, she had uh, accelerometers basically on the front of the bike. So whenever there was movement, as she went around the track, was giving me signals. And I was taking live signals from some of the machines. Some were pre-recorded because it was just too complicated to do everything live. And that was also going around in a circle uh, at the same time as the cyclists. The other thing to take note of is that we had four cyclists cycling for, for all they were worth, actually generating electricity for about half of this project. They couldn't do enough for the whole thing, but they did very well. We ran basically all the video, was, they, they ran the video, so they supplied the power as well. So we ticked the ecological box there. You know. um, and, um, but, but I'm glad we did, because it's like, that's where we're going. <laughs> um, the other things about this uh, will become self-evident as we go through. So she's got the interactive stuff on. That's the dentist. Move this on a bit because it's, 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 it's About 130. Um, well, like as with all community projects, so I, I had a, sort of, you know, the composer and me had organised, we had the bikes set up in rows and, you know, we had sort of um, classes of bikes. So there were a lot, you know, ones which, which were very kind of rhythmic and metallic, ones which were more wooden and they had stuff that was, it, the whole thing was sort of set out like, like a composition and it was marked very clearly. Every five minutes you would do these bikes and then you do that bike and it was all awesome. couldn't go wrong, you know. Fail safe. And of course after about twenty minutes everything was just like it was people just kept riding around the bikes they liked and didn't change them or they you know, fell off or they you know, it's like just so the whole thing just went into complete meltdown. But it kept going. I mean no one cared after a while. So in that respect it did become a community project. And um, yeah, so I just keep going with a few bits and pieces. Um, there were also, uh, this guy here actually just happens to be the guy who's got an electronic uh, thing on his bike. He's, he was one of the few uh, live electronic people. <laughs>
you see the whole thing lined up how it was supposed to go. Sorry, question? Yeah. How did the, uh, the town's like, general public react to it? Was it, was it quite... Well, it was okay. It's another thing about you know projects in general, which some of you you know will have to suffer. So, so I was dealing all the time with the bureaucracy of Canberra, and with the bureaucracy who are running this festival, and so we went and found this great site for our piece, and then they suddenly thought, oh, that's just not a bad place. So we're going to put everything there. So for the for the the day before and the two days after. They had these most awful, god awful things, you know, like Sonne Luminaire and the history of Canberra from, you know, 1920 to 23. It just fucked the whole place up. And some, and some stupid cabaret thing, actually in this space too, which we had to get out immediately. I mean, it was just like, this is what happens. Um, so, sorry, what was the question? <laughs> it just made me angry to think about those people again. How did, how did the general. Oh, the general public, right. So the general public, so what, what happens, of course, is that you know, schools and people say, well, you have to go and visit the national capital. So they drag these poor kids, you know, mumbling and groaning from wherever, all over the place, you know, five-hour plane ride or whatever, to get there. And then there's nothing to see and there's nothing to do. And so we actually had a... One audience was about... Uh, there were about 700 people, kids there, for some reason or other. And they, you know, just... They were supposed to be there to look at the nation's capital and look at the you know, the powers of parliament and that kind of thing and then go away. And they were sort of dragged into this thing and they just and they must have gone way back, you know, from Canberra thinking, Canberra's this really weird place they do this kind of, <laughs> they all ride around on bicycles, you know, and make a hell of a row. Um, so we did have an audience, but I mean we had a thousand we had a thousand people. Which for new music, okay, it's fine. But actually, you know, if they'd just let us have the thing, I think we would have had a lot more people there. Um, because people sort of, it was all buried amongst all the other publicity and stuff. So we were unlucky on that. But nevertheless, we did have a great space and we had a great time. So, I mean, the, uh, most of the riders you see are the public in a sense, too. You know, they are, they're part of this bicycling fraternity. Um, yeah, uh, I, I, I mean, I think. The problem, I think the thing about, not the problem, I think the thing about a project like this one, also like the Fence Project, um, people under, if people have a leg in to the understanding of what's going on, you can take them on to the next step. So with fences, everybody knows what a fence is, you know, and so they can go to the next step. Bicycle, yeah, I know what a bicycle is, you know. So you can take them, re immediately, you don't have to explain, you know, what a, what a, synthesizer is or what a string quartet is supposed to do or whatever you know like they're already there halfway to you so you can come to them and say well this is a buy and they can see how the things work and they can hear how it's working so um and also i mean the kids you know you hear them they're like screaming half the time it's like, it's like i mean that, you don't get that at new music concerts so Making it a bit less alien, kind of. Yeah, it's and, and also as I said, the, the weird thing about camera, one thing they got right was that it, it's by, got bicycle lanes, so they actually understand they're in a city that actually takes care of that. Um, there is this just on this, that sort of subject. There is this kind of tradition called Sharavari. I don't know if any of you know this word, um, and it's it started in, in and it's a European tradition, and it started in medieval times and. Uh, initially, it was about if if uh, somebody in the village, you know, married, you know, a woman married her brother or did something that was not cool, um, people in the village would get like pots and pans and make a hell of a row outside their house, and this became a sort of a tradition. And then it actually changed around to like having a go at people in power, like a priest who like you know had it off with a kid or whatever. And they would go around and make so so this this sort of ability for the population to make a hell of a row, either you know against uh, something that's gone against the norm or uh, corruption or whatever, and it, it exists still to this day. You know, people tie tin cans onto people who just got married. You know, in a car. So it's a long tradition in some countries, like in Switzerland, actually, oddly enough, there's a lot of Sharavari events, and so I was aware of this also. You know. People like to make a hell of a row, you know, if it's a good time, kind of thing. And and also they have some sense of actually they're making the row, you know. Exactly. That's that's also a translation of Sharavari, rough music. So um, yeah, let's carry on. Let's...
The other thing about this, of course, we have, the, in terms of acoustics, we have this beautiful relationship between the outside sound and the inside, this sort of bunker place. Mm -hmm. and, and the same sound is just absolutely transformed. So the thing you're not getting, of course, is the surround sound thing, the fact you can hear stuff in the foreground, in the distance. And so that's, you can't do that. It's just, you know, shitty video. <laughs> So those just bikes that just went past, the first one had an uncentered wheel. So this guy who's just like bike mechanic um, actually made a bike where the, where the, the wheel, the, the, the axle is not in the centre. So it's like it's giving you this whole rhythmic sort of function, which is like a beautiful. The next thing that, that that's, in front, that's actually a rolling pin. Somebody's mother gave to it. It's under a weight. And so that's just like makes actually a really squealing noise. I mean, a lot of the sound that you're hearing is not necessarily directly in front of the um, camera. electronic thing you're hearing there, that's the, that's the guy I told you about earlier on his bike. We, it didn't somehow get a recording of him live, so I just added him into the mix. Otherwise he would have been upset. <laughs> That's the queen I like to ride my bicycle. something I forgot to mention. So right at the doorway we have another interactive system which is like a strip uh, across the, the actual entrance of the door. So every time a bicycle went over that they triggered another set of alarm call. You just heard one then, ooh, bah, bah, like a sort of any kind of signal, signaling. You hear a cock-a-doodle do, you hear all kinds of things. Basically signal. So the bicycle, the cyclists were also aware that they triggered other things, not just their own personal stuff. And coming up, I think you're about to see the four guys. Oh. No, no, you don't see him. This guy was always cycling the wrong way around. find this. 
there's also within the actual bicycling thing, there was a kind of a central part where people could just go ape shit. <laughs> see them. There's four cyclists doing the generating electricity. Anyway, so it sort of ends up and gets more and more intense. <laughs> This guy was totally out of his head. sort of ended like that. <laughs> so it was about an hour. And now I just want to look at some of the um, more close-ups of the instruments. We actually had a whole team of six of those. That's the rolling pin. Fire extinguisher. Tom drum. So the other thing I should tell you that so all the bicycles that we we used came from a thing that was uh, very nicely named the recyclery in Canberra. So all secondhand bikes you can you can just drop them off there and they give them a new tyre, maybe a brake, and people can buy, you know, students mainly can buy them for like $15, and then they use them for a year, and then they hand, hand them back. And so we, we got access to all these bikes uh, on the proviso that we return them all. So everything we made, except for like four instruments which I kept, um, basically just got pulled apart and put in back, back as they were in, in their original state. It, in terms of like this as a project, um, Another thing you'll meet if you ever try and attempt such things like this is this, the, the, the legal requirements of public liability. And so uh, in Australia, this is huge. You know, they, it came in after 9-11, actually. I and mean, before that, you could do what the hell you liked, and I did. Um, but after 9-11, the, the lawyers who run public insurance and stuff were obviously out there playing golf thinking, how can you make more money, you know? 
musicians, you know. They, they never say boo, they never put up with anything. Let's just make it that they have to have public liability. If you stand on stage in Australia and you're a musician, you have to have public liability. So for something like, and that's, you know, play the piano. So for something like this, you can imagine, like, the eye walls would like, you know. So I signed a bit of paper with my eyes shut. I have no idea. I know what the top said. It said something like, we uh, agree that all our bikes will be at manufacturer's specifications when they're used in this project. And after that, I stopped reading. So I just signed whatever it was, you know. So clearly none of these bikes were at manufacturer's specifications uh, and hadn't been for many years. And now there's no way they were. Um, often we use the bike mechanism, um, uh, sorry, the brake mechanism uh, as part of it. So most of them didn't have brakes. Um, and let me find a few, just... <coughs> this is a nice kind of, a very simple idea. This is, this is a symbol we found in the street. And, of course, it, on an, uh, when you go over a bump, if you have a, a symbol that's loose on a, on a stand, it's going to jump up and make a noise. And then we also added um, a little finger mechanism, too. So you could have... Come on. <laughs> That's a music stand. So this is a, a cheap little amp, and it's just feeding back. And you can, as you can, change the pitch of the string, and as you move the, the handlebars. You also get a variation through that, so it's just it's just plays itself, and it's quite. I, I really liked it actually. And this actually didn't appear in the performance because it was actually being charged up in another room, and a whole lot of us forgot that it was even there. And there was actually a real there. There was prop could have well have been something like thirty bikes that didn't actually appear in the performance. That they were just like either not used or they were forgotten or something went wrong. <laughs> The thing about the kitchen sink, it wasn't the last thing, to, including the kitchen sink, it was actually the second instrument we ever made. So there was the violin, and then we went straight to the kitchen sink. And um, this is a very nice mechanism, because you can actually, when you, when you coast and don't drive, it actually stops, so you can actually play rhythms by it. You can be quite specific. <laughs> existentialist wonder. So, so two hammers basically trying to destroy each other. So the pitch is being raised there on the bike, you can, uh, on the brake rather. So actually the string is tightened, and it's dri it's actually driven. The 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 the, um, the source is from the back wheel, so the back wheel is 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 driving the 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 uh, revolving wire all the way to the front and up to, to cause that to go round. So as you can imagine, there's a fair bit of latency. So you can and then you can change the pitch. So it's a I kept that.
So this gives you some idea of where these machines, when they go past you, the, the phasing effects and... <laughs> It's a garden rake. That's also with a hand brake mechanism, bring it like that. And this is a master yes. Somehow only a dentist could come up with that. That's Paul's <laughs> personal mistake. What else have we got? Oh, it's kind of So could you play a little bit the beginning of the BBC one? Okay. Um, oh, I like that. Okay. Lots of things to like. Okay. So this is this is remarkable. This was actually so you take you take a a project like this into Canberra, thinking no one has an idea of what we're going to do, and there's a guy there who made this. <laughs> Just got to show you the piano before we close. This is on. This is on YouTube. There's there's the windmill. There's, oh, here's the piano. The piano is killer. <laughs> so I tuned the whole thing to a D flat major chord. So it was always. Just... Stop with. Okay, so you wanted to think we go to the. Um... Yeah, I mean, if anybody has questions to that, maybe the questions first, and then we do a little bit of the of the bow and. Right. Then talk about more. Okay, uh, I'm trying to find BBC session. Here we go. So yeah, any questions? I don't ride a bicycle. Kind of interesting. The sound has disappeared. From it's muted on the video. Ah, that's why. All right. So, nothing on bicycles. Okay. So now we're sort of stepping back to about like halfway through the first part of the lecture. So, the idea of interactive violin bows. And um, well, we we were just we just found this. Uh, so. There's quite a lot about it. So this, this cable um, has a number of sensors on it. The first one is, is a not a very good development of my original idea, which was the bow pressure itself. So that worked because that had a, 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 a vertical axis. The bow here worked very well. It, was, it looked tacky, but it worked very well. There's pictures of that we can go to if you want. But with this one, the guy used something much more beautiful in the sense it was a pool sensor so you couldn't see the sensor and the, and the sensor was in the thing but the problem is a bow hair is not a pure vertical expression it sort of goes like in a strange tilt so that never worked very well but that's one of the clues uh, one of the sensors it had there for, for real time data uh, the other thing was of course uh, accelerometers in the, in the 
what we call the frog of the bow, the bow. Uh, in the bow uh, itself, which is fiberglass, there was an aerial which transmitted to a, a, a receiver underneath the fingerboard. Um, and uh, there was ultrasound, which basically, it's sort of an ultrasound, sends a signal and it gets uh, bounced off the receiver back. And so it's a good thing for measuring. Um, that's my, one of my first uses with the bow technology was ultrasound because it's actually very, it's a very useful thing. And it's also it's nothing that gets really messed up um, by other signals in the air. One, I'm going to tell you more things that are wrong with this because, you know, this is I could kick myself actually for having jumped on board with these guys on the West Coast because it seemed like, you know, wow, I could never manufacture this incredible thing. But um, when Keith, who designed the bow, set it up, um, there were no iPhones. And he thought, Bluetooth, what a wonderful thing. You know, because all my bows had wires coming out of them and I had to learn how to play the violin with wires coming out of the bow. But his thing was, there's no wires, thought, that's wonderful. Bluetooth. But of course, Bluetooth is a really screwed up protocol, as some of you may know. Um, and so um, I've had to stop people like coming into the sh these shows now. They have to switch off their Bluetooth. They have to switch off their iPhone before they can come in. Because if they are in, even though Bluetooth lets you select the one you want, in fact, it, it just gets screwed up by all the other Bluetooth action that's going on. Because there's a lot of information going backwards and forwards. So that's a, that's a protocol he chose to go with, and this is sort of such a classic sort of story, moral story of today. You know, so that was in uh, 2008, there was that decision, I would say. And then 2010, I was there working with him, and we got the bow working. And by then, you know, the world was becoming sort of iPhone territory. And, and I hate to think now, I've got to use this thing again uh, in a few weeks from now. And I can't imagine what I'm going to what I'm going to see on my screen from the Bluetooth. <laughs> so <coughs> this is like the thing about technology, uh, especially technology today. It will just shoot you in the foot. You know, it's like uh, you think you might have something covered, and then they go. And anybody who uses Macintosh knows that um, every time they upgrade their operating system, of course, you, you're stuffed if you've had some kind of um, software made by somebody specifically for it. So I have at home um, four Macintoshes, and they stay there, um, and each one has a particular program or a particular stage of a program that I've made at Stein. Uh, and they basically, I keep this Mac because it works on that. You can't, it won't work on any new Macs at all. And I wait for these machines to die, and when the machine dies, so is the project. It's sort of just you have to be you have to be philosophically you know available for the idea of entropy with this stuff. It will, even though you think yeah, this will, two years from now nobody knows. And also nobody knows how these things work. They know how where, how their bit of thing works, but nobody knows how a Macintosh computer works. Not one person. They only know their little bit. And so, if you've ever worked with a, you know a high powered high speed programmer, you know when you get the readout of why something doesn't work, they're just like zillions and zillions of lines of code that aren't right and they don't look at it <laughs> they just go oh, yeah maybe try that uh, try that no, try that and then, oh yeah it works okay and that's it and so that gets passed on and you can guarantee in this little machine there's code like that that's been passed on was never really solved was never really fixed before they went on to the next thing so for, for an analog brain like me this is like you know the kind of thing to make your blood temperature raised because it's like you know no, the person hasn't fixed the original problem <coughs> and they sort of have a fix and it gets handed on half fixed and with any kind of interactive technology which is homemade you're going to face that kind of problem and um, or you have to buy the corporation dream which is you have to upgrade everything every time they say jump you have to ask how high so yeah the cable it doesn't sound like you really want one does it? Yeah. Have you ever harnessed the uh, data distortion kind of experimented with it by sort of using a limited number of... You could, at the, in the early days, yes, absolutely. I mean, the, the, the first thing I... Um, when I first went to Stein, so this was 85, and um, 
that it was a very interesting period because uh, it, what MIDI had been around since 81, 82 or something. So it was still like this sort of fresh baby. And uh, there were people there who were trying to make, you know, trying to give haptic feed, you know, this, this, is, this doesn't care if you're doing your email or watching a movie, it doesn't give a fuck. It's a, it's a machine. You know? and, it, and, and it was trying to make a relationship between a musician and this technology which had some kind of level of haptic feedback in a traditional musical instrument sense. In other words, it spoke back to you. You, you got something, you can, you, it happened in the brain, it went through the arm and the muscle, the fingers, the machine, the instrument, whatever, and came straight back at very, very high speeds, incredible levels of complexity. And so, as you were making, you know, on the violin, the, the move from one pitch to another, all these things have happened, and it's, you can't possibly, in any level of consciousness, have made a decision about that. And that's the kind of thing we wanted to have with this technology, and it's still not in, nowhere near there. And, and so, in 85, so I went there, I met some very bright people, George Lewis was there, you know, and I saw that George had taken six years to make this really dumb thing work. And I thought, George is a smart guy. You know, he's a pro I'm not going to be a programmer. If it took him six years, I'll just work with people. You know. I know how it works, but I'm not going to sit there. Because programmers at Stein used to burn up. I mean, the hardware and the software guys lasted about six months. It was too much. And each project that came in had to be addressed. You know. Then they came up then with Michel Weiss, which was sort of, yeah, came up with the idea, well, we need a sort of all-purpose, real-world-to-MIDI interface, and they came up with the Sensor Lab, which was an amazing... I've still got mine. It's quite a, an amazing... It's a box. looks like a brick. And one of the major differences between then and now is this had absolutely no visual interface at all. So you would program the thing on Mac, upload it to the box, and then you just... Played like a, like a, like learning a violin. Where are the notes? You don't know. <laughs> and so, these the, the programs that I that I used with the Sensor Lab, I, I l had to learn them, learn them in the sense that I had a mental map in my head of where we might be going and the sort of things that might happen. And because a bow is is a very organic piece of equipment. I mean, it, it depends, as you can imagine, how tight you tighten up the hair. Um, the temperature in the room. I mean, a bow responds to you know humidity, to dryness, to how tight it was, and to what you're doing. So you can play, you know, you can ghost a, a note with the with the bow hair barely uh, receiving any pressure at all, or you can dig in like crazy, and then it takes a second or something before the equilibrium has arised back. So you could play with these ideas about how you were screwing with the technology and how it was messing with you. So that was the point. There were these, these possibilities, the grey areas, which is what you know, most people in music look for. You don't want like a 100% result. You want something that's going to keep you engaged. And that, that was possible. Also, the stuff that the modules that came onto the market was bizarre things. I mean, I had a, a K1, a Kawai, and so I had you know, 256 sounds, of course. 256 waveforms, and uh, but the transient sounds at the beginning at what made the thing interesting. Some guy in Tokyo at, late at night was you know given the job of well, pick 256 transient sample sounds, and for some unknown reason he picked the sound of a piano hammer without a string, clonk. Don't know why, but it's one of my it was one of my favourite sounds. It was like. <laughs> Because it didn't read to, you know, saying this is an instrument, saying where this came from. And so there were things. Also, just with the way that the, um, even though it was digital, it had, it had the, sometimes the kind of um, distortion and, and interference that you got from analog systems. Because they have waveforms too, uh, in it, which, were, which, which you could, met, you know, get a one waveform to drive another waveform in in an old synthesizer sense. So it had stuff, it had factor. But basically, when you, if, if I listen to it now, I think, yeah, it's a clunky old you know, thing from the late ages. Um, so those grey areas are what we try to get to with this stuff. Uh, you can hear me rambling on to some BBC guy. Um, what you don't hear from this, of course, is the fact that it's a surround sound system, which was another traction that uh, Keith and Barry, the guy who did the software for, this, for the cable, 
were into, and I thought, I've never done that. And it just seemed like a natural thing. And I use a lot of circular bowing. So you have, you have this um, beautiful analogue between doing this on a in very personal internal le level with the instrument, and you can actually drive that around a room. Mm -hmm. So that made some, you know, in my analogue brain, that made sense. Yes, I'm going to drive this sound around the room. I'm not going to use uh, an LFO to drive it. I'm going to physically drive it. So there were certain elements about this that, that, that attracted me to go jump in with this new thing. So. <laughs> To imagine this is all whizzing around the room at 100 miles an hour. Oh, come on. So, John, I think you mentioned nine or ten different ways in which you can kind of measure measure movement and pressure, etc. Just, just, just talk us through those, if you will. Well, the first thing you can see up here on, on the chart is the, the accelerometers. Okay, so, so that's in the, um, in the frog, in the frog the which is the, 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 the bottom of the bow where you hold yeah, onto it. Close to where you are. So you're moving that around in different directions yeah. in the graph. Is Sideways, so you know, how you hold the bow, so, you know, in, is again if you a reading. <laughs> Chances are you're just going to make porridge. Just <coughs> um, I use a lot of circular bowing, and I can use the bridge and the bow length measurement to 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 create surround sound with that. And I physically drive it around the speaker, so it's a it's a, it's a perfect little kind of analog of, of what's going on between. So I'm saying the same shit now. Is <laughs> <laughs> this is a sample from one of the violins, and I'm just going to scratch it. Using the bow length. This is a pre existing sound? Yeah, yeah. This is a pre existing sound. <laughs> Expression because it's <laughs> it is mind blowing. I mean, the, yeah. the, just in something relatively simple like that, there's so many That's, possibilities. And just as you move your arm away, I could sit there and play with that for you know ten minutes quite easily and, and, and uh, find different stuff to sort of mm. say about it. Moment. Um, yeah. We should call it a day. Well, um, th there is a, this was done for radio. This is why the guy is talking and trying to explain what John is doing because uh, they don't see him and it was recorded just uh, by somebody, um, but not for, for, for broadcasting. So the, the guy had basically had to translate what John was doing before the um, yeah, I mean, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> it was great. I mean, if there are any other questions... Um, yeah, or you can come up, you know, some people just don't like yeah, showing their cards. Absolutely. In public. <laughs>
And then uh, tomorrow we, we are getting to it. So uh, you all got the, um, the email. So uh, you, you can tell Yes, I'm, I'm going to... You should bring... You have, if to be in tomorrow, you have to bring something. Something that makes sound. Uh, something you can control to some degree. And, um, and we're going to work together, and we're going to work together as a group, and we're going to perform and play music together. My side, I'm going to um, set up one fence string, and you'll see how I use very simple technology, and you'll see what you can get from something very simple. So there'll be that, and we can, if anybody's got you know, more questions or technical stuff, which you think I know and you don't, you, you can go there, and we can we can, we'll still have this set up, I think. Yeah, mm. so we can find stuff. If you know, any any anything, any little technical thing, any issue, any philosophical thing, anything, whatever it is, I'm not here the day after. <laughs> and so, yeah, please come, and you know, don't don't be afraid, don't be afraid of it. Just come with something, even if it, you think oh, this is really crass or this is whatever. You know, um, not only we'll tell you it's crass, we'll tell you how to use it. Like anything, like anything. Acoustic things, like things. if you can only play the, if you can only play the table, bring a really nice table. Okay. And is, is there a there's a mixer, isn't there? There's, there's a like mixer. Regular. I think we've got uh, eight channels. So, um, yeah, something with a guitar jack plug on the end of it. I think I don't know if it's got a cannon or not. So that sure for sure a, a jack plug will work. If you are a guitarist and you play electric guitar, then bring a little busking amp or something. So if you have amplification, it's best if you bring it, because you know how it works, for starters. And the first lesson we'll be learning is how to turn shit off. You know. <laughs> so, um, yeah, well, I hope to see you tomorrow, then. Yeah.